And everyone, thanks for coming back to another FinMap episode. Today, we've got an interesting one for you. Uh, we are here with Renergen CEO Stefano Marani. So over the past few months, but especially weeks and, and even days, there's been a lot of talk about Renergen on social media, especially Twitter, uh, where various concerns and questions were raised. Uh, and Renegade is currently trading at 11 Rand per share. It is down 42% the past six months, down 62% the past year. And today, it's so far, I mean, it's it's quite volatile, but so far it's up around 12% uh, after Renegade announced or, or published a new sense announcement to bring more clarity to various questions. Uh, so the market did react positively towards clarity. So this video is to br bring more clarity to the various questions and concerns that was raised on social media. Uh, so I would recommend for your own sake to go read that sense announcement where the questions are answered. This v interview will be to expand on that and to answer the questions that the rest of the community also asked on social media. So we'll start with which Rene Jenner responded to and then uh, the rest of the community questions. So Stefano, thanks for being here and, and giving us more clarity. Uh, so let's dive into what you put out on the sense announcement. Uh, why was the Lind, uh, I don't know if it's Lind or Lindy, helium container on site when the company already had a container? Uh, so this, this one is actually more of a technical a technical um, issue. So the the one container on site belongs to us and it's it's physically mounted to the ground. It's it's a static container. It doesn't go anywhere. So filling it up, even yeah, you know, we fill it up, it's it's not going to the customer it's staying with us which means that you do need to have a customer container on site and then what happens is that you fill up your container once your container is full you then transfer from your container into the customer's container that's the normal way of doing it um, and a transfer a transfer is is a relatively quick process it's it's a number of days um, but filling the container before you make the transfer takes time now, the issue over here is that what we realized and what we discussed with the client was that is, um, is it just makes the, the process more efficient in terms of a turnaround time for the customer. And given the desperation for helium at the time, this became, this became something that they, they and us agreed to. Um, hence the need for two trailers on site. Nothing more sinister than that. Okay. Uh so the next question, a bit more in the overview market. So if we look at the share price and and you know how it's it's fallen, obviously a lot can be because of social media. But there's obviously also going what's going on in the the overall economic market. You know people are prefer, preferring companies that are profitable and and giving cash flows and all of that. So uh, with the leaks, uh, obviously it doesn't help the early company if there are delays to the original plan. So. The question is, uh, the leak in the helium box, was it the same as reported in last year, uh, December? And how has that affected, you know, the delay and the production and, and all of that, the, the leaks that, that has been happening? Yeah, so there, there were two separate and distinct incidences and in different parts of the plant. The December 22 leak was in pipes. Um, and we're talking about big pipes interconnecting modules. Um, and those were those were then repaired. Um, the leak in the cold box, the cold box is just basically it's it's equivalent to a giant thermos. Just think of think of your your coffee, your coffee thermos. You fill it up with coffee in the morning, and then you you go out for your sports event, and uh, and your coffee stays hot. Um, there's a vacuum there's a vacuum wall in between the inner and the outer chamber, and that's what stops conduction and convection because there's nothing to conduct. And it's the same thing with a helium cold box or an LNG cold box. A cold box, by definition, is just basically a giant stainless steel thermos. And you've got a vacuum space in between. If there's a leak, then obviously you can't maintain the vacuum. And if you can't maintain the vacuum, then you can't maintain the cold temperature without expending an enormous amount of energy um, to overcome the thermal, the thermal gradient from, from the leak. So yeah, you've, you've got to repair the leak if you want the plant to be efficient. And that was the realization that we came to. That was a completely separate and distinct leak. That was a leak in the vacuum chamber of the cold box, not not the pipes interconnecting the modules. Two separate leaks. So, you know, personally for me, I, I don't know that much about uh, the chemical side. I, I don't really enjoy physical sciences at school. But more on the tech side, I know that we get bugs. Uh, when you do a new software update or even in normal software, you get bugs. 
And I'm guessing in your case, a leak is a bug. And, you know, with, with the leaks, is it because of the supplier? Or Because I know there's been a few questions, you know, about the supplier or the quality of that. So uh, should investors consider that, you know, maybe more leaks would come from this because it's just part of, part of you know, development and part of production and, and all of that? Or do you think you've, you've got it under control? Because I think when, there's, when expectations are met, that's, that's when the market reacts positively if, if they know what they can understand. So do you think the leaks are now sorted or, you know, is it just part of, part of the process? So it's a, it's a very smart analogy. I, I like the analogy. That's really clever um, in terms of drawing, drawing the parallel between bugs in, in, in a program and, um, and the, um, the commission of a plot. So I'm, I'm also very glad that you brought up the, the misconception that because, because the equipment comes from a specific jurisdiction, it's subpar. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that the quality, the quality of the plant depends on what you're willing to pay for the workmanship. Now, when we acquired the plant, we went through a full tender process between equipment from Germany, equipment from America, equipment from France, and equipment from China. The lenders weighed in on that process, and they used their external independent engineers, um, one, of the big, uh, one of the big LNG engineering firms in the United States who then scrutinized um, the bids and we came to a conclusion as to which plant was the most efficient plant to operate. Um, and that's efficient vis-a-vis -vis not only the running cost, but also the most efficient in terms of once it's operational, what's going to have the least maintenance downtime. So from a quality perspective, we've got no issues with the quantity. The plant, you know, during the construction phase, those very same engineers have come out, they've inspected the plant. Um, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing from a quality perspective that's subpar. This is commissioning. These are commissioning problems. Now, the leak in the cold box could have been one, to, one, one of many, many um, um, causes. Um, I'll give you an example of a possible root cause. A, an example of a possible root cause is that the cold box had been pre-assembled and then put on a ship and then moved on a truck and then offload it from a truck and put down on the ground and you don't know how many bumps it's been subjected to along the way. The possibility of a leak is entirely there simply by virtue of the fact that these are big pieces of equipment that aren't meant to be rattled about and you don't know what happened to this piece of equipment in transit. Once you've got it operational and you've got no more leaks, the beauty about this equipment is that it's very robustly made with incredibly heavy metal, uh, in, incredibly heavy and robust materials. It's predominantly three or four gauge stainless steel. And that means that once it's working, it's working and it, it doesn't stop. I'll give you an example. The BLM in the United States operated for, I believe, more than five or six decades before it had, had the, the, the cold box had its first issues. Cold boxes have minimal to no moving parts, which means that you can do whatever you want with them once they're working. So the likelihood of more leaks, very, very low, very low. Um, but you've got to make sure that in the first instance, it doesn't have one to begin with. And that was the challenge that we had. In the first instance, we had a leak from the very beginning and that needed to be repaired. Okay. So uh, let's look at the production capacity because at the end of the day, that's, that's what we need to look at, uh, the, the sales at the end of the day. So what does what does Renegen's current production capacity look like? What's what's the update on that? So at the moment we're we're on LNG. LNG at the moment is somewhere between 20, 20 and twenty four tons a day. Um, obviously helium, we're going to have helium on before the end of the year, um, and we'll be uh, you know we'll be we'll be ramping up from there. We've already we've already stated and included in this announcement that during the course of the first half we'll be up at full nameplate capacity. Um, but yeah, from the very beginning, we stated that it was a stage of get the plant fully operational in terms of all modules working, and then you start the ramp up phase. And that ramp up phase, yeah, is uh, is in the process of being of being um, uh, implemented. And that's also evident from the fact that you can see quarterly production numbers were up quarter on quarter. Uh, so the next question is uh, uh, also an elephant in the room, and you did address that, and that is obviously. So Renegent is a new company. As a, as a new company, 
you need to you need to make headlines in order to get some some traction and, and get people talking. So obviously, religion has has a strong PR, uh, let's say, call it campaign, and a lot of people are following religion. Uh, I'm sure this video will even get lots of views just because you know religion is something people talk about. And obviously, on social media, it just spreads even faster. So the, let's combine two questions. You know, what is the reasoning behind religion really focusing on? frequency sense announcements and uh, being active on social media and informing people and on the other side uh, are you using paid researchers uh, so there's there's also been a question you know small talk daily which is is one of the uh, the big analysts in a uh, well-known analysts in south africa like have how have you been using that strategy and and how, how do they fit into the the overall pr campaign and uh, uh, yeah maybe just more clarity on that front yep so the yeah. You know, in terms of the engagement with social media, it was important in the beginning to educate the broader audience as to what helium is. Bearing in mind that it, by 2015, Renogen was the world's first listed helium company, and that's globally. Now, that means that helium is a niche commodity. As a niche commodity, you know, back then, very few people other than those in the industry knew that it was used for for more than just party balloons. Um, and social media was an incredibly effective platform to get that message out and that understanding out. And that also requires podcasts. It requires media engagement. And the, the frequency of that engagement was high in the beginning because we were still in the construction phase and we were in the education phase. Um, you would have noticed, and you certainly can't fault us for putting out too many announcements in the last 12 months. We've gone down right to the bare minimum of what is required from a legal standpoint. So, you know, we're not as engaged as we were before. The SENS announcements have dropped. The media engagements have dropped. And that's because we took a strategic view that we were going to move from high frequency education mode over to letting the operations speak for themselves. For good or for bad. The, yeah, the move forward, we aren't going to change that strategy. That is, that is the new lay of the land, and that is, you know, that is how we, that is how we're going to engage with, uh, with shareholders. With regards to paid research, absolutely, we use paid research. I'd challenge any single company out of the top forty to hand on heart say that they don't use paid research, um, and that's because it's, it's simple, simple mathematics. If you are a broker, you're going to make your most money broking the most liquid stocks. And therefore, you want to try and create more liquidity in those stocks. And so you hire an analyst, you pay a very big salary. The analyst then writes in-house research, and that's what you use to promote liquidity in the stock. That's fine for the top 40. You might even see it spill over into the top 100. You move outside of the top 100 market cap stocks in the JSE, it's not worth any broker's while to write research unpaid for research on any stock outside of the top 100 and I'd argue probably the majority of those outside of the top 40. So yes, we, we use paid for research. Um, who do we use? We use Blue Gem. They disclose in their report that it is paid for research by the company. We've never hit that fact. Blue Gem has never hit that fact. Um, and I don't see why it's so contentious when it's contained in the report. That's the way that things work. Um, we use, uh, we use MST out of Australia. Exact same thing. It's disclosed. We disclosed it. There's no issue with that. Um, Small Talk Daily, they do disclose it. None of, this is, none of this is contentious. And all of it is contained within the statements. The fact that people choose to highlight it, even when it's contained within the report, I think is somewhat disingenuous. Because that is the way that the entire South African market works. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a case of the pot calling the kettle black over here. Thank you for that. Uh, next to a bit more also technical and historic, Malopo's 2013 annual report deemed the Virginia gas project to be uneconomical uh, for commercial development. Uh, so that's obviously in 2013, many years ago. You know, what was, you know, is that accurate, first of all? And uh, can you just maybe give us like, how, how does that fit into where Reg region is now? Of course, it was uneconomical. Yeah, everyone knows the story that Nick and I bought, bought, the, uh, bought the project way back when way back when um, for, uh, for a very favorable price. The reason that we managed to get away with it was because the seller deemed it to be uneconomical. 
Um, you know, that wasn't, we didn't deem it to be uneconomical. They deemed it to be uneconomical. But, you know, they were also drilling a major asset in the Permian Basin in Texas, I believe. They also had multiple assets across multiple jurisdictions. They were cash strapped and they hadn't spent sufficient money to actually be able to. You know, we happen to be at the right place at the right time, taking significant financial risk because what we acquired at the time did only have a, a proven reserve of about 17 BCF at 2P. At 1P, it was about 11 BCF. 11 BCF is so minuscule. It's so minuscule. It's, um, it, it was uneconomic. But, you know, in this vehicle that, uh, that we used to buy the asset, Windfall Energy, we went out, we spent money, we did over two years worth of geological work, um, you know, from drilling, from um, desktop analysis, from studies, from acquiring data from neighboring mining operations. And putting all of that together, we then employed the services of a Canadian qualified reservoir engineer who came out and verified all of the data that we accumulated in the wells that we drilled. And then the net result was that there was a significant uplift in terms of the valuation. It was also at that point that helium was then incorporated into um, into the prospects of the company, which by the, when, when we bought it, helium wasn't even a feature of any of the reports. So that, that was that was where the major value uplift came. But yeah, we yeah, we're proud of the fact that it was deemed uneconomic by the previous sellers. That that was what created the opportunity in the first place. Moving on to uh, the next question, uh, what was integrated capital management and Trillion's involvement with the company? Uh, and are there any further links or ongoing links? So obviously, this is one of the questions raised by Albi still here uh, on, on Twitter. So, uh, you, you know, Trillion's history and, you know, there's, there, there, there are a few, few things that, that raises eyebrows. Uh, so what is the, their involvement and are there any current involvement links? So initially, ICM and uh, Trillion, now Trillion Asset Management, not Trillion Capital Partners, two separate and distinct entities, or at least they were at the time. So ICM and Trillion Asset Management were appointed joint book runners for the IPO, and ICM prepared all of the paperwork as our, uh, as our sponsor for the JSE. That started November 2014, and it went all the way into early 2015. Um, and then from then on, um, ICM uh, also assisted with the preparation of the filings with the JSE on the DSPAC of Renegen. But aside from that, there have been no further involvements with the company, with either companies. And you know, it needs to be said that we did those transactions in 2015. At the time, absolutely no allegations were doing the rounds. And also bearing in mind that Trillion Capital Partners only acquired Trillion Asset Management long after we had concluded our transaction, the IPO. So from that perspective, yeah, there's the timing, the timing doesn't even make sense from trying to draw any, any kind of chronology. There was also some kind of statement as to whether Trillion owned 24%. No, Trillion Asset Management was a custodian in much the same way that you could look at a shareholder register and say, well, Standard Bank owns you know, X percent of Y company. That's not true. Standard Bank is a custodian that holds shares on behalf of beneficial owners. That's the way the South African legislative framework and JSE listing framework makes you report. Thanks for that explanation. Uh, and now a big question that, I mean, directors' dealings is always... I love it when, when a director buys shares uh, in, in the companies that I own shares in. So the question is, are Stefano Mirani and Nick Mitchell selling stock? No, we are definitely not selling stock. When we acquired the asset, or rather, let's say, when, when, when Renogen was despacked, um, we were given allocations um, by virtue of our shareholding in Windfall at the time. Since then, we have increased our net position and it's, it's all good and well to do it on a percentage basis. That's somewhat disingenuous because yeah, if you do it on a percentage basis, the percentage is going to go down only because 
the company had issued more shares along the way and therefore there was dilution. So that is a, that is a very misleading way of looking at it. The fact of the matter is, is that the number of shares that Nick and I hold today is more than it was when we entered into the company originally. The only time that either of us disposed, and it was fully announced in the market, um, I made a donation to my mother, Nick made a donation to one of his family members, it was a small parcel of sock, um, and then aside from that, uh, recently we were awarded shares under the share incentivization scheme. Um, those, there is a disposal of shares of the tax portion of the shares. <clears throat> and then you get the balance. So net, net, you're getting a net, you're receiving a net number of shares. And the only disposal is the tax component that you owe to uh, to uh, Mr. Kiesweter. Aside from that, <clears throat> those are the only two incidences. And both of those were in the public domain and both of those were reported. If, if I'm not mistaken, I, I once read, uh, I don't know if it was a report or somewhere on, on one of your documents that... Uh, you know, with share incentives, there's certain targets. If you meet those targets, shares are granted. Uh, and obviously, time, tenure plays a role, but also valuation plays a role. What is the next uh, target, let's let's call it that, for, for you or for Nick, to for the company to reach that share price in order to get the next set of, of Renegade shares? Uh, so we've got two schemes. We've got the long-term incentive, and then we've got a bonus share plan. And the bonuses are based on annual performance. Um, the, the very, very big... Um, payouts are massively aligned with shareholders' interests. So the first target is 75 rand a share. Um, yeah, it's ambitious, but I'm still I'm still optimistic that um, that we'll be able to hit these targets. Okay, now let's get in the game. So uh... seems like a long way. I know standing here today it seems like a long way away, but um, I'm uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. Okay, moving on to the community questions. So these questions were asked by you on our social media channel. You can follow us on all the social medias at FinMeUp. Uh, the first question is, the Tamron issue and insider selling, which combined with Ivano, are being used by short, short sellers to create a crisis of confidence. The production issues and plan that has been made out to be substandard. Uh, and then also the expected price of helium, which apparently makes phase two not viable. So there's a few questions in one question. So let's first tackle the Tamron issue and insider selling, uh, which combined with Ivano are being used by short sellers. Yeah, so Tamron wasn't an insider because none of the individuals or beneficiaries in Tamron were ever directors. So technically they're not insiders. Um, I don't know that that's a legal response, but the fact of the matter is that that also happens to be the truth. Um, it's not the company's position to report on shareholders' dealings unless the shareholder makes it available to us. That is a legal requirement. And, you know, us reporting anything to the contrary would be a violation of the JSE rules. So while I know everyone is very curious to find out what the answers of here are, the fact of the matter is, is that if anyone wants to know, then you would need to go and speak to shareholders directly and not the company. It's not the company's prerogative nor does the company have a legal ability to make disclosures on behalf of shareholders. That's just not cricket. So, so that's on the, the Tamron side. And, and I don't know, uh, I know there was, there was also a question on, you know, can you give some more details of, of uh, I know you can't say everything probably, but maybe just some clarity on why, why did they walk away? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the way that that's been phrased is interesting. Walker, because, you know, is it a walk away? Not, not technically. The fact of the matter is, is a few things happened. The transaction was entered into before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The due diligence period was going on well after the invasion started. Macroeconomics changed for all companies um, around the world. And critically, while we were all working to a timetable, the fact is, is that the due diligence period expired. It was a 120 day due diligence period. We got to the end of it. A transaction had not been consummated by then. And given what was happening in the market, it was one of those deals that fell over. And that is what it is. And we told the market that it fell over. And there's nothing more sinister than that. Obviously, 
it's a it's a beautiful fairy tale to try and paint that there's something more sinister or that they uncovered something or blah blah blah. But let me put it to you this way: let me, you know, Occam's razor is a beautiful thing, and you know, for those of you that, that haven't watched Contact, um, Occam's razor says that the simplest explanation is obviously the most credible one. And well, that's paraphrasing, but kind of. So the the reality of the situation is this: subsequent to the Ivano transaction not being consummated. Consider this fact pattern. We've had the United States government come in and do a very thorough due diligence on a $500 million loan that ultimately got signed off by Congress. And you can look it up on the internet and you can see that there is a congressional seal on that loan. It went to Congress. Before something goes to Congress, it goes through a very thorough due diligence period. That meant that their LNG engineers were out from the United States, their independent advisors, their legal counsel, their accountants, absolutely everyone went to town on us. And then we had Standard Bank as well. And Standard Bank did an independent, complete and thorough due diligence, exactly the same as the United States government did on us. We have put out in the last quarterly that there was another transaction that has been done. Um, more details on that are to follow. So I, I'm not in a position to be able to divulge too much, but that was also subject to an equally thorough due diligence. So now if we deploy Occam's razor, what seems the more likely outcome? Is the more likely outcome that we didn't get to the end of our period and the deal fell over and it wasn't as a result of due diligence because we now have major international credit or credible institutions having done the exact same thing, gone through the exact same process and having taken the decision that they would proceed on their transactions? Or is it that it's all smoke and mirrors and that you've got two guys standing over here who managed to completely hoodwink the United States government, hoodwink Standard Bank, hoodwink all of these other investors and managed to piece together with MacGyver-esque duct tape and sticky tape and chewing gum and some strands of hair, a story that managed to get past all of those independent advisors because they couldn't find something that Ivano did. Okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm glad you raised uh, that the, the U.S. government and, and all of that is there any plans or, you know, any comments or updates you can give regarding a U.S. listing? Is, is that still on the, on the table and uh, in the short-term roadmap? Yeah, so I, I can tell you that we're, we're making good progress over there. Um, there, are, there are SEC rules that I am now personally bound by, so I have to walk a very, very careful line on what and how I disclose. Um, I can tell you that we have made a second private filing, and we have now received formally comments back from the SEC. From there, there is uh, there is work in progress for addressing the comments with regards to the prospectus, um, and that is a work in progress, and everyone is very happy with the progress that we're making. Um, more than that, under SEC rules, I'm not at liberty to disclose more, but it's 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 an ongoing process, and we're very we're very um, optimistic about the progress that we're making and the timing that we're making. Perfect. Part of that first question, I just want to get back to that, is uh, the second part of the question is the expected price of helium, which apparently does not make phase two viable anymore. Maybe you could just comment on, you know, phase two, the, the viability of that, and also maybe just the price of, of helium currently. So the economic viability of phase two um, is, is very insensitive to the price of helium. Now, point in case, take a look at, Take a look at any project. If you're going to mine gold, and it's the easiest, it's the easiest analogy that people in South Africa understand, because they've been investing in gold companies for years. If you invest in a gold company that has gold in its ore at a concentration of five grams per ton, it's going to be on the margin and very susceptible to the gold price. If you invest in a gold company that has 25 grams of gold per ton or 50 grams of gold per ton your cost of production is going to be so low that in a race to the bottom, you're the last man standing. Again, I, I implore you to consider Occam's razor. 
look at the projects in the rest of the world where the concentrations are at 0.01 up to 0.35%. And then you look at ours at around 3% all the way up to 12%. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out that in terms of cost of production, we have an exceedingly low cost of production. And that automatically, fundamentally makes phase two not only viable, but very profitable and insensitive to many market factors. You were asking about the price. Not much has changed. Um, you know, you had the BLM go down again, come up. It's been a little bit more reliable than it was last year, but then you've had you know, compounded issues with some of the other plants and their reliability. The squeeze is not as bad this year as it was last year, but what you have started to see this year is that on the demand side, demand has started to increase the squeezing on the market again, and that's because of a thing called the CHIPS Act. The CHIPS Act was passed in the United States as a countermeasure for the risk of too many semiconductors being manufactured in Taiwan. We all know that story very well. And so a number of the semiconductors are now being met, the plants are being built in the United States. And the, the rationale over here is that they will manufacture chips in the United States for their market. But that means that now you've got significantly more helium demand because you've got Taiwan still producing what it was producing before. You've got new chip factories coming up online in the United States and they're sucking up a lot more helium. To give rough ballpark figures, previously you had um, semiconductors consuming about 4% of the world's helium. Now you've got them somewhere, I, I believe the figure is closer to 12%. And there was one analyst at the recent helium conference that suggested that consumption in the semiconductor space could increase as much as 26% year on year for the next decade. Uh, just for the semiconductor market. So, you know, the, the helium prices are still very, very attractive. Very uh, so just a question, you know, to maybe maybe just establish a relationship there is, how open are you to have a discussion with Obisilia to, to clarify your, your concerns and, and answer his questions and him asking you more questions? Yeah, you know, we've, we've always maintained an open door policy with everyone. No one that's ever called management up and asked for an engagement has ever, ever been refused our time. Um, and we're always happy to meet. What we are not interested in doing is ending up in some kind of a public spat. Um, with with anyone regardless of what their agenda is or what our agenda is so you know to the extent that mr salias wants to come and meet with us and ask any questions that he wants to he is more than welcome i'm pretty sure he has my mobile phone number he, you can you can get it quite easily i think everyone does if you judge by the number of spam phone calls that i get all the time so clearly my phone number is out there and it's pretty easy to get um you know we're here give us a call happy to meet we'll even come and meet you I oh, would, uh, would love that to happen and, and get clarity there. Uh, then another question, update on alien production. So you already gave that, but then it goes further. Progress on the loan, IPO, geo, uh, geopolitical issues of alien production in SA. So just a general update. Uh, and maybe in that update, you can focus more. What are what are the current risks to Renegent? Uh, I mean, all companies have their risks. What are Renegent's risks at the moment that, that you have to address? So right now... Um... So let's, let's touch on a few of those. The loans, we've signed the commitment letters with the financial institutions. Um, the, the covenants, you know, we're, we're well within all of our covenants, so that's, that's not an issue. The risks now are um, potential timing delays in terms of the commencement of the construction of phase two. So to that extent, we've got a window anytime from now until probably the better part of May next year in which we can conclude the IPO which won't have a material spillover, actually won't have any spillover in terms of the timing of the turn on of phase two. If we get to the point where we have it IPO'd by May, at that point, then it's a, de a linear delay. So every single day that the IPO is delayed from May, then it's every, you know, that delays the turn on of the plant in phase two by one day. So that's one of the risks that we're, you know, that we're monitoring. Uh, in terms of in terms of our IPO window, 
you know, the window opens this year and then we've got we've got the first window open until probably about June next year. So all of that is aligned quite nicely. Um, you know, another one of the risks is macro and tailwinds, at least or market headwinds. You don't want to be IPOing at a time when you know everything is going to hell in a handbasket and markets are absolutely shocking. So that's always going to be a material risk to the IPO. Um, with regards to with more operational risks, I think we've we've faced the majority of the operational challenges during the commissioning. Yeah, we've all seen LNG production has been increasing. Um, so. Right now, it's a case of making sure that once we've once we turn the helium module on and that's that's up and running, it's then just a case of you know tight, um, battening down the hatches and making sure that we run a tidy ship when while running the operations, um, and then make sure that we that we that we ramp up the plant in accordance with our schedule. Um, but you know, compared to where we were, say 12, 24, 36, 48 months ago. The risks to the company have significantly, significantly reduced. And if you think about the major de-risking events, we've proved up a significant resource, or rather reserve. Reserve is technically the correct word. Now you consider the size of the reserve, and the reserve was only done over fourteen percent of the area. So I don't think that there's anyone in his dog that would come out and even try and dispute whether the gas is there or not. <clears throat> then you've got a question of can we raise the debt? And that was the one thing that everyone was speculating. Well, guess what? We actually did, and we signed the commitment letters. That's done. Um, so now it's a case of moving on. This little period of, uh, of instability too shall pass, and we will get focused back on to doing our real jobs. And once we're back on, you know, on, on the task of doing our real jobs, that's a case of making sure that we secure the equity for phase two. We've got time to secure the equity for phase two, and that's what we're working towards. And uh, and we're going to do it in a manner that's going to dilute shareholders to the absolute minimum. And, you know, I'm I'm there in the trenches with shareholders being a significant shareholder myself. Nick is in the trenches with the shareholders being a significant shareholder himself. It suits no one for us to dilute more than we need to. Okay, awesome. And, and then the last question, which uh, and I quite like this question because I'm, I, I also love you know the the bit of clarity that these things bring usually when startup raise funding you know, have to provide the roadmap and, and all of that so the, the question is can renegen provide shareholders with a bit of a blueprint or milestones they're chasing or roadmap to better understand the journey and to keep investors calm in times like these because if you know that you know 2025 this is the plan 2026 this is the plan uh, you know any kind of blueprint or you know what's to come what we can expect uh with with you know, I think shareholders would appreciate that. Is that something Regen can do? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know that was that was the one takeaway and the one learning. One of the takeaways and learnings from this process is um, is is more clarity. More clarity is always better, and and how to engage with shareholders in that regard. Um, you know, we've obviously through this announcement and through through the recent quarterlies, we have provided a blueprint. I'm not going to bore your your listeners with with the blueprint. Um, we've touched on we've touched on the next milestones in this call already so regurgitating it i think is just going to occupy more time than necessary but um but certainly there's there's been a fundamental learning in terms of making sure that that the communication is crystal clear that we cover all the bases and that uh, and that we reiterate what the plan is and where we're going from here so yeah we've got a we've got a long road ahead it's an exciting journey it's a first for the country it's uh, it's very significant globally and it is a truly, truly proudly South African story that you know the rest of the world seems to be completely rallying behind. Um, it would be it would be great if for once, you know, we we had the the same level of support um, unanimously across the South African market on on what is a truly, truly amazing South African deposit. Awesome! Thanks so much, Stefano. Thanks for watching, everyone. This Friday we are back with the stock spotlight with Paul and myself, where we cover the most important stock during the week with extra insights uh, thanks for watching if you find value share it with your friends uh, there's always uh, it's always good to get some clarity uh, and i'm sure we'll have stefano on uh, again in the future for further clarity and, and updates have a great day cheers